What is up everybody? So for today's video we're gonna be checking out why Green Lantern was actually good. So yeah man, a lot of people hate this film. Um I don't really know why. But you know, uh we we'll gotta figure out why. But anyways I'm fucking lit. Let's just get to this shit. Ready three two one. Please don't make it super suit green. Or animated. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Aries. So with the recent <coughs> flops of films like The Flash, Shazam 2, and Black Adam, PCEU movies have found themselves in a really bad spot. So bad that Blue Beetle and Aquaman 2 are likely destined to suffer similar fates. You bury. But fortunately, we'll be getting a reboot of DC's interconnected universe come 2025 with James Gunn's Superman Legacy, which will actually feature Nathan Fillion as the Guy Gardner version of Green Lantern. You know, I was in a bar five once. Hey, wait, who won? But all this got me thinking about another time when DC messed up so bad that they had to start over. A DC film that was so universally hated and a box office bomb that it was even excluded from what would eventually become the DC Extended Universe. A film that, in hindsight, may have saved DC movies as we know it. That's right, I'm talking about Green Lantern. Now, a little later, I do want to talk about the upcoming TV series, Lanterns, a show that's been in development for a while, but will officially be part of Gunn's new DCU. This will be DC's first big attempt at revisiting the character of Green Lantern since that 2011 film. But with the recent failures of so many DC movies and even superhero content as a whole, this got me thinking, was Green Lantern really that bad? Yes. Thanks for watching Screen Crash, I'm Doug the Manager. Wait, 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 hold on. I really do think this movie may be getting more hate than it deserves. I mean, sure, the CGI was awful, the story was clunky, and the villain was a giant fart cloud that made this version of Galactus look not so bad. But this movie actually has a lot of redeeming qualities. The first being Ryan Reynolds. He's a great Hal Jordan. The ring's limits are only what you can imagine. Do that again. Reynolds is now mostly known in the superhero movie world for playing the Merc with the Mouth. God, you ever showed up, pal? No. And that's a key reason why he was so great as Hal. In the comics, Hal Jordan wasn't exactly quiet. He's a funny, quippy, fast-talking guy who was rarely found speechless. You love the dark. Reynolds brought the humor, the wit, and the charm that I'd expect from Hal Jordan. So, say what you will about the movie, and believe me, there's a lot to say, but I think Reynolds was perfect casting, and honestly, it's a shame the movie didn't work. But I'm actually not too upset about it, because had the Green Lantern been a massive success, then this may have been our only Deadpool. No! God, please, no! No! Wow, those Deadpool movies really were Ryan Reynolds' first good comic book movies, huh? They were, yeah. I mean, even before Green Lantern and X-Men Origins Wolverine, he was in freaking Blade Trinity. He's come a long way getting from there to he has, but Reynolds wasn't the only success story to come out of the ashes of Green Lantern. Taika Waititi played Hal Jordan's best bud, Thomas Kamaku. Waititi, of course, went on to direct the best Thor movie, Thor Ragnarok, and does voice everybody's favorite rock creature, Korg. Angela Bassett played a very different take on Amanda Waller. And then she went on to play the queen. But the most powerful nation in the world! Tamura Morrison plays the father of Jason Momoa's Aquaman. Clancy Brown voiced a much what? cooler villain with the fire giant Surtur. And Sinestro's Mark Strong went on to play the Shazam villain, Dr. Savannah. And Ryan Reynolds got to marry Blake Lively. Yes, that's true. Reynolds and Lively, who are now married with children, met on set of this film. And oh, the chemistry what? between their two characters is one of the best things about the movie. Lively's portrayal of Carol Ferris was great and a real standout for the genre at the time. The character was not your stereotypical damsel in distress. She's a strong and independent woman that challenged Hal and pushed him to be better. Now who's the damsel in distress? <laughs> <laughs> Another good performance in this film was Peter Sarsgaard Hector Hammond. His portrayal of a misunderstood mad scientist was actually really impressive, but I'll admit that things did get a little goofy toward the end when they turned him into Mr. Potato Head. You uncultured swine! And that's one of the film's main problems. It's goofy. Take this scene, for instance. That's... That's really dumb, but in its defense, the movie is aware of itself. And I love this scene where they poke fun at the absurdity of the mask actually protecting his identity. Oh my God, Hal! How did you know it was me? What do you mean? I've known you my whole life. I've seen you naked. You don't think I would recognize you because I can't see your cheekbones? I also really enjoyed how bold this film was, especially for its time. Now, we'll talk about the CGI in just a sec, but I want to give this movie a little praise for embracing the idea that superhero movies don't all have to take place on Earth. This movie went big and showed the planet Oa, home of the Green Lantern Corps, 
and we got to see lots of different yeah, but like only for like the a ring. Second. This gave the movie a sense of scale that we have not really ever seen in these movies before, except for like in Thor, but that movie came out in 2011 as well. Now, speaking of being bold, let's talk about the CGI. Yes, the CGI in Green Lantern is pretty rough. In fact, it was so rough that in the original trailer for the film, Warner Brothers shelled out an extra $9 million to make it better before the movie was released. But look, I don't think it was that bad, what? especially for 2011. I mean, look at The Flash. That movie CGI was awful, and it came out in a time when computer effects are becoming indistinguishable from real life. Well, at least when the artists are given ample time. I'm afraid you are forbidden from boarding without permission. My own ship. If there is something you need. Well, there is, yes. My pistols and my men. Keep asking to see them. Your men were brought to Toranagasama city of Edo for their safety. As for your guns, we can fetch them if it becomes necessary. Now look here, Mariko. Your lord and I had an arrangement. Oh, what the fuck am I watching? Gosh damn. Well, time and compensation, what that the is. Fuck? The Green Lantern gave us our very first head-to-toe CGI suit. Now, we've seen this method used more and more in recent years. For example, look at the Iron Spider suit or the Quantum suits in Endgame. All were completely CG. And so you, you don't notice, but every time you see one of your heroes in that that suit, it's CG. digital. And if we compare those CG suits what? to the Green Lanterns from over a decade ago, it's not really that bad. It was a major first step for visual effects <clears throat> and superhero films. Now, another thing that really hampered this film was the behind the scenes drama. Right now, we're seeing both Marvel and DC being heavily affected by the writer's strike. And by the way, we've got a great video up on the channel discussing the strike, so be sure to check that out. But the Green Lantern was also affected by a writer's strike that was going on in its early days of development. So you could say that the Green Lantern's failure is a prime example of why studios should respect and take care of their writers. That's right. Anyways, the writer's strike wasn't the only hurdle this film faced. It went through a lot of changes before it was finally made. And even during the filming process, it was still undergoing major script changes as well as casting. Originally, WB approached writer, director, and comic book enthusiast Kevin Smith to write the script. But after his experience on the canceled film Superman Lives, starring Nicolas Cage, as well as the lack of interest in the character of Green Lantern, Smith turned down the job. There was what? even a point in time when Zack Snyder was going to direct the film, but he turned it down to ruin another DC project, Watchmen. And of course, Snyder would later return to kick off the DCEU with films such as Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Snyder's Justice League. Crap, crap, mega crap. But imagine if Snyder wow. had done Green Lantern. How would that have changed the trajectory of the DCEU? And like I mentioned earlier, this Green Lantern film was originally going to kick off an interconnected universe of DC characters. If Snyder had directed Green Lantern, then it probably would have been a very different film, certainly darker. But what if it still became the critical and box office failure that we know today? That could have resulted in Snyder never being brought on for Man of Steel, thus drastically changing the DCEU as we know it. Hell, the DCEU may have never even begun. And if the DCEU never existed, then we probably wouldn't be getting the upcoming and much needed James Gunn reboot. Wow, so in a weird way, the Green Lantern did so do so. Yeah, now speaking of Snyder, despite him not doing Green Lantern and Green Lantern not being considered canon to the DCEU, Snyder actually floated the idea of having Ryan Reynolds reprise the role of Green Lantern in the Justice League for a cameo, an idea that now seems like a no-brainer. Disliked movies and their stars have a tendency to be looked on more fondly after some time has passed. Take Henry Cavill's Superman or Andrew Garfield's Spider-Man, for example. Both are instances where the actor and their films were panned when the movies first came out. But then years later, the films have found themselves beloved by most fans. Like Green Lantern, The Amazing Spider-Man 2 is pretty universally loathed, but fans like myself still cheered when we got this callback in No Way Home. Now, I think Ryan Reynolds would have gotten a very similar response had he showed up for the final battle in Justice League. Plus, it doesn't hurt to have the guy who played Deadpool show up in your superhero movie. Hey, it's me. Don't scratch. But I guess DC saw things differently and didn't want any reminders of that failure. They haven't really touched the character of Green Lantern with a 10-foot pole since 2011. I don't want to play with you anymore. And that's honestly a shame because Green Lantern is such an awesome character with such rich lore. Not having that character be a part of the Justice League it just felt weird. And it looks like the DCEU is going to end its more than a decade long run without ever formally introducing the Green Lantern into their universe. We got Captain Boomerang, but not Green Lantern. Okay, I guess to be fair, we did technically get a quick Green Lantern cameo in the Snyder Cup, but that... Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't count. And I'm not saying the DCEU's Lantern had to be Ryan Reynolds or even the Hal Jordan character. They could have brought in Jon Stewart. From the Daily Show? Nope, not that Jon Stewart, this Jon Stewart. And we'll actually be getting both Hal Jordan <laughs> and Jon Stewart in the DCU's Lantern series, which sounds absolutely amazing. Real based TV show, which is almost like True Detective with a couple of Green Lanterns who are space cops watching over precinct Earth. 
Green Lantern space cops solving deep space mysteries, man, sign me up. So look, the Green Lantern movie had a lot of issues. So many issues that it's going to have been like 15 years before it and the Lantern show. But honestly, I think this movie may have gotten a little more hate than it deserved. And when you compare it to today's comic book bombs, I begin to wonder if- Perhaps I treated you too. So, yeah. let me know, is Green Lantern really as bad as we thought? Are today's DC Fox giving it a run for its money? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. He's for Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. I mean, I guess some moments. It has some moments in it, you know what I mean? But, for the most part, the dialogue is what mostly gets... Like, what, why it's a fucked up shit. But anyways, man, if you guys like my reaction to this video, give this video a thumbs up, and I'll see you on the next video. It's just the dialogue, bro. The fucking the dialogue.